Good morning again. It is almost time for us to begin with our time of morning worship at 1045. For those of this is your first time visiting with us, uh, there we go. If this is your first time visiting with us, we're going through a sermon series entitled The Preeminence of Doctrinal Preaching. Uh, it's just a sermon series uh, set up just to put the focus on sound, structural, doctrinal preaching. Uh, too often, uh, the, the pulpit has been used to entertain. Well, it should not be to entertain, it is to edify. So we want to uh, ask you to go ahead and come in and get ready. Please have your Bibles. We're going to have some selected scriptures. Uh, won't just be in one place for today, but hopefully you'll be able to look on with us as we go through God's word together. Uh, we come on a few minutes early just to greet each other and to say good morning and to hello and, uh, and hello to each other. So I pray that everyone is doing fine. I pray that you've had an opportunity from Sunday school to now to refill your coffee cups and to get prepared and to get ready. Certainly, I pray that everyone's in good health and in good peace. So, Sister Jackie Brown, good morning to you. Sister Lucretha Brown, good morning to you as well. To the Milam family, God bless you. Uh, I hope that everyone is in as good a mood as I am. Last night, I got uh, uh, some pretty good sleep, some of the best sleep I've had in a long time. So, you know, it's one thing to thank the Lord for your home, uh, transportation, job or whatever means to meet financial obligations i've learned to thank him just for a good night's sleep to be able to lay down and rest to let your mind cut off your body recharge that's a beautiful and a precious thing to the burnett family god bless you also it's a wonderful thing to lay down and to rest and to be at peace lord i tell you so many people don't have peace they may have money may have a lot of other things but if you don't have peace what does it all really matter anyway? So I'm thankful for a good night's sleep. I'm encouraged this morning. Uh, the sermon series has been encouraging to me. It's been something that has been on my heart for a long time. Uh, I don't, Sister Halton, good morning to you. I don't, I don't mind singing programs, Christian singing programs, different groups. I, I don't mind them, you know. Uh, in my early years of ministry, I have seen it. Uh, abused uh, so but I don't mind them but I can only listen to good gospel singing so long I can listen to gospel preaching all day I mean I can start in the morning with a sermon and have another one and another one and a lecture it's something about the Word of God not not being in love with theology but just learning more about the God that we serve, learning more about, oh, that's what this passage means. Some of the things that have been a blessing to me over my life, some of these tips and some, well, not tips, some of these truths from the word of God. I mean, they have really been a blessing to me in my life. And I'm happy to know that, you know, God has reached out to me and gave me a good understanding of his word, taking years and years and years of study. And guess what? I'm still on the road to discovery, that the, the process of study. I'll say this, I don't want to preach before I preach, but the process of study is what sanctifies the preacher. Uh, getting online and robbing somebody's sermon and copying and pasting, that, that has no effect on you. You don't even know if it's really correct if you haven't done the research yourself. But when you study God's word and you look into what his word says, you look at the history, the background, the culture, the scene, the previous chapter, the latter chapter, I mean, and you put all of it together in a nice little package called a sermon. That process of study, prayer, uh, research, that is a blessing because you learn so much more than what you're intending to go into the study for. So it's 1045. I want to give just a couple of study helps at the end of our prayer. So if you can have your pen ready or if you're watching this, you can come back and re look at the recording and get these names. I want to give you some information of good books to study to enhance your own Bible study yourself. So let's pray together, church. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, uh, thanking you for all that you've done, for all that you are. 
knowing, Lord, that living in a sinful world does not mean that every day will be smooth, every day will be easy. We do understand that we are not exempt from trials. But even in trials, with tears running down our face, to still raise our hand, even in difficulty, with a heart that's grieved and heavy, to still say, bless your name, even through turmoil, to be able to bow our heads and submit to your will in prayer. Father, all of that strength can only come from you. Today, as we study your word, different texts, different scriptures, we pray, Lord, that we can have a right understanding. Don't let this be an exercise in futility, but it's our desire, it's our goal, Father, to seek you through the preaching of your word. I pray that you'll help me, assist me. There can be no preaching without the power of your spirit. I can't rush into this with head knowledge and information, but Father, preaching must be done under the power of your Holy Spirit. So I pray that your spirit can rise up mightily, Father, to the end of it all, that you can receive the praise, honor, and glory. We ask this collectively in the name of Jesus. They all said amen, amen, and amen. When your coffee gets to that perfect temperature, boy, it's just, that's gold right there. Let me give you a couple of tips, uh, treasures that I have had over the years. Um, one thing that I want to suggest that many of you go out and purchase, you can purchase it. Uh, the best price will be at a bookstore online, probably one of the major ones. Uh, going into a store, the book will be more, but it's a book. It's called Systematic Theology. Systematic Theology. The author is Wayne Grudem, G-R-U-D-E-M, Systematic Theology. That book, it takes every biblical subject. Uh-oh, do some housekeeping here. That book takes every biblical subject and compiles scripture on it and puts it all in one place. Here's all the scriptures about marriage. Here's all the scriptures about baptism. Here's all the scriptures about preaching and whatever biblical subject about angels. And you can read through it, Old Testament, New Testament, direct verses, examples of all these things. And you can see a conclusive view, a thorough search and view of God's view on a biblical subject. So I'll just give you that one for today. It's called Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem. Book may cost a little bit, but... Listen, we spend enough on other things. We can invest in our ministry as well. So to get started, uh, this is part three of our sermon series, the preeminence of doctrinal preaching. By, pre by preeminence, I mean superior. I mean the standard and not just preaching, but doctrinal preaching. And so today we're going to come by way of a question. Why should we preach the word? Now, I want to begin by giving you, I guess, an example. I want to give you this example. Um, have you ever been around someone that is, I'm trying to think of the right word, that is prone to be involved in controversy? Someone who, when they come around or when you're around them, they will do something or say something to slight you, to hurt you, to upset you, to offend you to malign your name, uh, um, someone to where when they come around, there's always a problem following. They're, they're, they're attracted to turmoil like a moth to the flame. And when you be around a person like that or a group of people that way, you already know going into it, oh my goodness, ah, what they're going to say this time. How will they do it this time? I can't, you know. The one thing that has helped me in dealing with situations like that, people like that, over time, when a person shows you who they are over and over and over and over again, is to change your expectations. A part of what hurts you in dealing with people like that, who are hurtful, who are offensive, uh, who malign your character, who are always attached to some type of controversy, is to just know that's what comes with the package. The shock value is because you expect something different, but you keep getting the same negative treatment. So you have to, in essence, at least in your mind, 
change your expectations. If you expect, well, this person is pretty dishonest. So I already know when we encounter each other, be careful what you believe because they're not the most honest individual. Once you've changed your expectations, it kind of helps you understand the situation that you find yourself in sometimes. I, I said all of that to bring us to a bigger point is that when we come to church, when we listen to preaching, when we listen to teaching, when we are in a worship service, when you hear a eulogy from the scripture at a service, a funeral service, we need as a congregation, as God's people as a whole, we need to change our expectations. And what I mean is we come to a church, I'm speaking in general terms, many people come to a church expecting to be entertained. That may not be what they say, but the, when you hear comments like, well, he didn't really say nothing today, but what did he say wrong? I mean, all he did was talk to somebody. He, I mean, he was talking from the Bible, but it really wasn't fun. What they mean is, I didn't get a show. I didn't have some jaw-dropping shock value phrase. He didn't say some edgy thing. He didn't say some witty thing. And if you go into any preaching or teaching expecting that, when it comes to doctrinal preaching, you're going to be let down. And let me tell you why. Because, yes, there are passages in Scripture to where you just got to say, Lord, thank you. You may not be the most vocal person. You may not be the most talkative person, but you come across a certain passage of scripture that hits your role and encourages you when you're going through a rough time, a tough time, a job situation, and that scripture comes up, you can't help but say, Lord, thank you. But there are other things in the Bible that God has for us that may be a bit more I'm going to use this way, phrase mechanical. It may not be fun. It may not be quote unquote exciting or entertaining, but it is what you need. And so when we come to church, whether it be logging on via live stream or however you are being taught God's word, we must change our expectation. Preaching is not to make you happy. It's to conform you to make you holy. And so we're coming by way of a question this morning. Why should we preach the word? It may seem a trivial question, even a rhetorical question, but there's too many times across this great country of ours to where the word is not being preached. So why should we preach the word? Let me tell you why one reason, many reasons why we should preach the word because it promotes biblical literacy in the church. Preaching God's word promotes biblical literacy. When you have a knowledge of God, when you have a knowledge of God's word, you will grow. First Peter chapter two, verse two. Now I, I love the writing of Peter because when we get to first Peter and second Peter, Peter has been off the scenes now for approximately 20 years. You recall he made that vow to Jesus. I'll follow you to prison and I'll follow you to death. I'll follow you if it costs me my liberty or if it costs me my life. And what did he do? He denied even knowing who Jesus was, just like Jesus said he would. Jesus meets with him again in the last chapter of John, John chapter 21. He calls him back into the ministry. He says, Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. He repeats the question three times. Many people say because he denied Christ three times. When the end of the gospel of John closes, the next thing that we really know about what Peter's been doing, and we do have some stuff in Acts, but the things we really know about what Peter's been doing He's been pastoring people. And we see in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, he tells God's people, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. When we preach the word, 
We increase the biblical literacy of the congregation. When you preach the word, the more people know about God, they begin to grow and to mature, assuming that they're trying to implement it into their lives. You see, the church is not a movie theater where you come and sit down, have your popcorn and a slush, and look at the show and rate how, <coughs> excuse me, and rate how entertaining it was on your way home or when you get to Waffle House after church. The church is a place to where you should learn the doctrine of God. You should learn about the God that we serve. And it is incumbent on us as ministers, as preachers of the gospel, to preach the word, to give them book, chapter, and verse, not mouth, teeth, and gum. We must give you God's word. You know, there's a difference between fast food and a home-cooked meal. You know that, don't you? You can pull into the fast food place of your choice, order a number, whatever, and you can just about eat that before you get home. Before you get home, you better eat them fries or that little nasty burger that probably not even real meat. But it's something about, what, listen, when's the last time you bought a pack of ground beef and tore the edge of it open and, got, and, and smashed out a hamburger and put some onion in there, some salt and some pepper and put it in a skillet and closed up the ground beef and put it back in the fridge and toasted the light bread. I said light bread. And put your, your toppings of choice on it. And cut your french fries after you peel the potato and fry them in grease. You see, that takes time for these things to be done. It's one thing to run and get you some chicken nuggets. But to take a whole chicken out and unthaw it. And to cut it up. And to season it. And to bake it or fry it however you want to. That takes time. Now they're selling potatoes in a bag for 99 cents. Mashed potatoes. There's a difference between a fast food meal and a home cooked meal. And there's a difference between standing up in God's pulpit and spitting out a whole bunch of cliches as opposed to making sure you take time to give God's people God's word thoroughly, directly, and concisely and clearly. Because fast food preaching will lead to fast food people. I've gone to programs and they say sermonette. I, I never understood what that was. I guess that's their way of saying don't preach long, but a sermonette will lead to a Christianette. You see, we must grow. And one way we grow is when the biblical literacy of the congregation has been increased. And that happens when we preach the word. We, if you accept Christ and you never study, and you never pray, and you never learn God's word, you don't grow. You remain the same person you were. You may have been saved for 20 years, but guess what? You're at the same place you were 20 years ago, and you make yourself low-hanging fruit for the cults, for the liberal professors on the college campuses, for all of the charlatans and all of the false teachers and heretics of the day. So why do we preach the word and only God's word? Because when we preach the word, it increases the biblical literacy of the church. Listen, and that's not entertaining. And the truth is, it's not supposed to be entertaining. It's not to entertain you. It's to edify you. So one of the reasons we stick with the book and preach the word is to increase the biblical literacy, the biblical knowledge of uh, the members of the congregation. Another reason we preach the word is because God's word, his word, is the ultimate authority in the life of, our, uh, of, of every Christian. His word converts the soul, consecrates life, and comforts the heart. You read his word to be wise, believe his word to be saved, and practice his word to live holy. God's word is the ultimate authority in our lives. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8. A very good passage. Isaiah says the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord shall stand, shall last forever. 
Do you know how many attacks have been made on the word of God? The very first words of Satan on earth was in the Garden of Eden when he slid up beside Eve and he challenged the authority of God's word. Has God really said? I mean, did God say you can't eat from every tree? And, and what did he do? He tried to tear down the authority of God's word and insert his own authority. I just believe that God's trying to hold you down. And if you were to eat that tree that he said don't eat, your eyes would be open and you'd be like God. You would know as much as he knows. God's word is authoritative and it has withstood the assaults from everyone from the beginning of time, even up until now. How many of you have met people? who will say things like this. Just type yes if you've heard it. Well, you know, all the Bible's not true. Oh, really? Okay. Or, or here's another one. You know, the Bible has a lot of contradictions in it. Does it? Okay. Normally, this comes from people who have never even read all of the Bible. And normally, the inconsistencies, apparent inconsistencies, or at least perceived inconsistencies, if you were to clear them up, they wouldn't follow the word anyway. And you know why? Because they don't have a theological problem as much as they have an authority problem. They just want to be master of their own universe. They don't want some God telling them what to do. I want to do what I want, when I want, and how I want. But when it comes to God's word, it's the ultimate authority. Listen, God's word gets all in your business. Listen, God's word tells you how to be as a man. It tells you how to be as a woman. It tells you how to be as a father. It tells you how to raise your children. It tells you women you are to wear respectable apparel. It tells you men you are to love your wife like Christ loved the church. It tells you if you love your child, you'll spank that child sometime. If you love them, you can save their soul from hell. God's word is the ultimate authority. But look at the attacks on that authority. Look at how when you begin to say something about the word, you're called antiquated. Uh, uh, when the word of God contradicts what the culture is doing, they will attack you by saying, well, well, well you're, you're, you're bigoted or that's unloving. Clearly and plainly what God's word says. What, what, whatever happened to a time to where when there would be a discussion about some issue, to where when God's word said it, that settles it. Well, why do you do this? Because the Bible says, hey, that's enough for me. That's not even enough anymore. The reason we preach the word is because we show that by staying with the word, it is God's word that is the ultimate authority. You see, it's not my job as a minister to be politically correct, but it is my job to be biblically accurate. And when you preach what the word says, line upon line, precept upon precept, especially when the word goes against what the culture is doing modern day at different times of our history, and you come under pressure for that, guess what? You don't have to defend a lion. We don't have to defend God's word. You just open the cage and let the lion do what it's normally going to do. You just preach the word and let the chips fall where they may. But we live in a time to where the attacks on the authority of the word of God are increasing and increasing and increasing. Now, listen, let me say this to you. The time is coming even more than it is right now to where the price that we have to pay in our obedience to the Lord is going to increasingly become more stern, more steep. The price that we're going to have to pay in our obedience to the word of God, that price is going up. You see, gas used to be 25 cents a gallon. That price has gone up. Bread used to be what? 50 cents a loaf. That price has gone up. A home used to cost a certain amount of money. A car used to cost a certain amount of money. That price has gone up. Ever since we've had the pandemic, guess what? Wood used to cost something last year. The price has gone up for wood and construction materials from last year to this year. And let me tell you something. The cost of discipleship, the price of our obedience to the Lord, it's going up. 
It's going to cost us more to rely and depend on the authority of Scripture. It's going to cost you more than just driving to church in the rain or driving to church when it's hot outside. It might cost you your job. In some cases, it has. It might cost you a promotion. They ain't going to fire you, but guess what? They ain't going to let you come into meetings and the CEOs with the executive talking that Bible talk. Mm -mm. We don't want anybody in there letting their light so shine before men. We preach the Bible because God's word is the ultimate authority. When you don't preach the Bible, what you are showing is that you don't think that the Bible has any real authority. It shows your lack of of dependency on the authority of God. It must be the Bible plus jokes or the Bible plus current events or the Bible plus whatever else. No, ma'am, no, sir. We stick with the book. We stick with the book and preach the word. Let me tell you why. Because it increases the biblical literacy of the members of the church. We need to know more than God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Oh, we got to increase that. It's time to take off that Sunday school training wheels. It's time to grow. So preaching the word increases the biblical literacy of the church. We preach the Bible because guess what? The Bible is the ultimate authority. Listen to me now. The scriptures override the preacher. The scripture overrides the deacon. The scripture overrides the church. I don't care what the church votes on. If it goes against scripture, the whole church is wrong. The scripture overrides the culture. And so God's word is the ultimate authority. And one of the final reasons, I'm just going to give this last one. The reason we preach the Bible, why we stick with the book, is because it lets God speak and not us. How many of you have an older sibling and, or it doesn't even have to be an older sibling, but your mama told you something or your father told you something and you're doing what mama and daddy told you and your sibling said, who said you can go outside? Mama said, I can come in the front yard. Daddy said, I can go outside and play. At that point, that child is telling you what the parent has told to them. In essence, what they are telling you is letting you know this is the parent talking, not me. You see, and when it comes to preaching the Bible, it is designed that God will speak and not us. One of the, one of the more common scriptures to bring this out, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the A portion, all scripture, not some of it. So for these folk who say some of the Bible is true or some of it's right, some of it's wrong, Paul disagrees with that. God disagrees with that. All scripture, all means all, is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration means God breathed, divinely breathed. God's word, the Bible, is the very voice of God, words of God put on paper. Guess what? And when you preach it, yes, you may be saying the words, but in essence, you are merely echoing what thus saith the Lord. And when we preach the word, it lets God speak and not us. You see, the motive is not to tell our story, but to tell his story. One of the things that has bothered me so much that has crept into the church more and more and more and more. We kind of have a social gospel now. You know, where we, we, we're talking about Trump and we're talking about Obama. Uh, we're talking about the mayor. We're talking about the governor. We're talking about this person in politics. We, we, we're talking about that person in politics. Uh, we're talking about entertainers. We're talking about critical race theory, CRT. We, we, we're talking about the celebs, and we're talking about the football team, and this, that, and the other. We're talking about WWE. I've heard them preaching on wrestling people. Listen, the pulpit ain't a place for that junk. Talk about all that stuff. Right now, somebody out there needs the gospel. Somebody needs to hear a word from the Lord. And when we preach the Bible, the reason we stick our nose in the book 
is because it lets God speak and not us. Whenever we preach the word, we are not to add to it and we are not to take away from it. As a minister, in essence, we are to get out of the way because I can't imagine a single mother dealing with all kinds of problems or a single father going through some custody battle or somebody showing up to church and they've got an abusive relationship at home. They have a child that's heavy on their heart. They have a job that's about to lay them off. They got financial obligations that they have to meet and they need to know that everything is going to be all right. We need some instruction. His word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. I need some direction. I don't have time to hear about who's ahead in the polls, about who won and who didn't win the last mayoral election. Listen, that has its place. Yes, we can discuss that. But right now, behind this sacred desk, somebody out there needs a word from the Lord. Somebody out there needs to hear what God's word says about their current condition. We can get to the other stuff at another time, but this place and this time is designed for us to give you God's word. Why? Because it lets God speak and we step out of the way. We need to know in his word what it says about our situation. I can't tell you anymore my testimony. A young man and trying to stay out the streets, wasting money. Lord have mercy, wasted so much money on junk and stuff. Whew, if I would have just invested, I could be rich right now. Try to pass it on to my kid. Don't do what I did. Wasted money on junk and stuff, sitting at home. And it was a Friday night. Friday night, and I got off work at midnight. Normally, I'd leave Levi Strauss and go run the streets and stop at this person's house. And stop at that. No, no, no. Go home. You're a husband. You're a father. Sit your butt down somewhere. Well, I was sitting at home, couldn't find nothing on TV. And I found myself bored. And something just came upon. It was just a thought. I know now it was the Holy Spirit kind of leading and prompting my heart. But I was like, why don't you read your Bible? That was foreign to me. Because reading your Bible was on Sunday if you do go to church. Had to find my Bible. I dug it out the back of the car somewhere, came back into that mobile home, and I began to read. What well, do I start at? Genesis? Revelation? The Gospels? I didn't know where to start. And I'm just flipping through my Bible real fast. Maybe I'll start with Psalms, and I'll read Psalms 23. No, no, no. I'll just start with the first Psalm. I ain't never read it. And reading Psalms, the first number, talks about the blessed man, how you're blessed when you stay away from the wrong people and how in verse two, you're blessed when you meditate in God's word day and night. Verse three, the results of staying away from the wrong people and staying uh, close to God. You shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters whose leaves shall not wither. Guess what? You could not tell me that scripture in that very moment was not written for me in my current situation. And you get people all across the land stumbling in the churches, driving into churches, needing to hear a word from the Lord. But what do they get? Politics, stats from the latest football, basketball game, the playoff between the Phoenix Suns and the Milwaukee Bucks. And my favorite player didn't hit the free throw, so my team lost. And Trump doing this and Obama did that and Clinton's doing They ain't got nothing to do with helping me with my everyday life. Preach the book and let everything else fall by the wayside. Because in that book, we find encouragement. In God's word, we find instruction and direction. In God's word, we read about God's son that left the balconies of glory for the dusty streets of Jerusalem. He was conceived in the womb of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Joseph was technically his earthly father. But Joseph did not have a drop of blood in the veins of Jesus. Because if Joseph's blood would have been in Jesus' vein, he would have had the same sin nature that you and I both possess. He was born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit. He walked, he talked, he ate, he slept, he lived, and he died just like a man. 
Late one Friday, they lifted him high and stretched him wide. But early that Sunday morning, as God, he rose from the grave with all power in his hand. And you know the problem that some people have with that most precious and fundamental story from Scripture? They've heard it so many times, they tune it out. They've heard it so many times, they want a different story. And guess what some of these so-called preachers in the pulpit try to do? Well, I'm going to cater to the needs of the people. No, ma'am. The story's the same because the truth don't change. Jesus lived and he died. He resurrected. He ascended on high. And guess what? He's coming back again. Now, will you be ready? Will you be able to hear him say, come ye, O blessed of my father? Or without Christ, will you hear him say, part from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Don't get me wrong. There are critics and scoffers and intelligent people with degrees and fancy sounding titles that will laugh at you. They will laugh you to scorn how the Bible said. They will try to mock you out, laugh you out of believing in an old dusty book called the Bible. Oh yeah, they're out there. But get, guess what? The Bible ain't going nowhere. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord shall remain forever. So why do we preach the Bible? Because it increases the biblical literacy of the church. It lets God speak and not us speak. And it is the ultimate authority in the life of the child of God. And let me close by saying, that's why Sunday school is important. That's why learning the word regularly in Bible study is important. That's why your own study tools and your own Bible reading it's important because I'll close by telling you this. You're going to need God before God needs you. Now, I do know there are some very theological people on here, and they are already raising a flag saying, hold on, preacher, because God is God. He does not need anything or anyone. If God ever needed something, he would then cease to be God. He would no longer be eternal. He would be temporal like you and I, and you would be correct. But it's just a play on words. The eternal God does not need us. It is a blessing that God chooses to use us in his plans. Because I can guarantee you this. I can guarantee you this right now. When your child laying sick of a fever and you don't know if they're going to live or die. I've been there. And you don't know if this medication is good or bad. And my daughter was so hot, I could feel the heat from her body in my hand. I wasn't singing Al Green. Mm -mm, mm -mm. I didn't turn to the rappers of the day. I didn't call on whoever the president was at that time. I didn't look to CNN and Fox News and MSNBC. I can tell you what, though. I went to his word. I went down in prayer. And I found out in my darkest hours that when you put your faith in an all-knowing, all-powerful God, the God that we serve, he can and he will see you through. So we must preach his word. And people, the only thing worse than a preacher not giving you a word is for you not even having your word open to know what he's talking about. Make sure that you have your word open and available. So guess what? So that you can follow along with him. And this is the, the preeminence of doctrinal preaching. We must make sure that in spite of the accolades, in spite of hand claps or a lack thereof, preach the book. Let the chips fall where they may. So, amen. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your participation. I've been trying to do a little bit better. I got me a, a timer here. My timer has run out. So I'm trying to be a bit more timely. I don't want to push and push and push and push. I want to be respectful, respectful of everyone's time. So I pray that there's been something insightful that you have learned from and hopefully something that you can grow from. I thank you for your time and your participation. For any other information about our church and our ministry, please feel free to go to newhebronlr.org and you can find old Bible studies, sermon series, whatever you like. You can just dig around and we hope that you, know, you can continue to be with us as we learn God's word together. So God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.